as per my um, tradition, maybe we'll start with a, a recap and just talk about what we'll do to, today. So we'll start with uh, summarizing. That's interesting that that comes up. Do you see that thing coming up? Oh, yeah. That wasn't coming up before. Anyway, if I do Control Z, okay. Perhaps I'll use the the things on the um, uh, pad instead. So we'll recap things we talked about last time. I think we will talk about experimental determination. It can come here, and someone else can grab it. Did everyone get it? Did you? Uh, no. You want to get your name down, and then we'll go back. And so, after we've kind of talked a little bit about what we talked about last time, maybe these are the things that we'll go back to. And so, the easiest thing to see, oh God, has my computer gone crazy? Thanks. Yeah. Is that we use this little figure here. Uh, to make kind of the case that, yeah, I knew if I started, there would be all kinds of people wandering around. <laughs> yeah. um, is that we could have these uh, situations develop. And we talked about the fact that this isn't controlled in any way by uh, the property of permeability, but it's really controlled by the capillary diameters that you can uh, get the fluid into, the non aqueous phase liquid into. Um, the reason for these kinds of behaviors is that in this particular case, you're sitting on top of a, a lens, and on top of the lens, the stuff dribbles off the other side, or it rises to a height on the lens that it can actually break through and go through. And so you end up with this interesting architecture that develops really just based on the distribution of these largest entry pores that the fluid can make its way into. So the difference between all these, I guess this one is that there's a smaller volume of fluid or that's getting hung up by being held up high uh, be because of the architecture. Uh, or in each of these, all the different cases are that we have different um, architectures in the, the subsurface. And in this case, you know, the ultimate uh, stop to all of this is that at some depth we have an aquitard that stops the fluid going across because it intrinsically has very low uh, pore openings within it. We talked about the, um, the rationale of why that was. And the rationale was this, is that if we're looking at pushing fluids in a capillary, then we can think of it either as a capillary tube or as a fracture, two plates of glass placed within water. Uh, we talked about being wetting fluids and non-wetting fluids, depending on the substrate that they're on. These would be wetting fluids. And in this particular case, this height rise that these rise to is given just by doing a free body diagram. Sorry. We know that the pressures at these two points are the same, and so we can cut it off at the bottom. It's the weight of fluid that we uh, have to suspend by the interfacial forces, and we get some fundamental relationships. And these are based on the fact that uh, the pressure here has to be atmospheric. The pressure here within this meniscus is subatmospheric. And I suppose what that looks like if we look at this hydrostatic distribution from atmospheric pressure here, the unit weight of the fluid gives us this gradient of pressure versus depth, which means that as you come some height h sub c above this, then this height has to be equal to a negative pressure. So we can surmise that the pressure within this meniscus is negative pressure, like the tension in a, uh, the strand of um, a suspension bridge is a, about the best analogy. The equations are slightly different depending on whether it's a, an aperture or a diameter that we're looking at, but they have the similar form increasing interfacial tension or decreasing diameter give you a higher height rise. And physically what that means is that the pressure you need to apply to dislodge it or to invade the porous medium has to be successively higher as each of these dimensions gets smaller or the, as the materials change. 
We can define something called the capital pressure, which is just the difference between the pressures as you go across this interface. And we can think of it as being equal to the height rise multiplied by the unit weight of this fluid, the wetting fluid in this particular case. And we can define it basically by this relationship that we have here. So that was uh, one of the things that we, we focused on last time. The other item that we said was that we could look at our system as comprising a bunch of these individual capillaries, not just one, but a, a bunch of them. Or we could think of it, we looked at this other geometry as well, these two grains in contact, and we could have a, a fluid that meets up between them. Oops. Uh, I guess it doesn't do it on here. That's fine. So the fluid is present in here. And if we think about that, we could do this thought experiment. And the thought experiment was if you have two capillaries, one very thin and one very fat, within a porous medium. Or, I guess, the other thought experiment was that we did this. I guess I could have gone back to reference them to hurry things along. Would be that a fluid that you put into those uh, would get hung up in here but would not get hung up in here. And a fluid that would get through this first round, if you like, I guess wouldn't necessarily get beyond the second one. And so it would be held up in here. And so what we'd like to be able to do is to be able to take this and to be able to explain what real materials would look like if we had a whole bunch of these. And so that brought us back to looking at, uh, I guess if I go back to here, uh, why well, doesn't want to do this is if you look at the porous medium then we know that it's not quite as simple as just individual capillaries because a capillary can only be, be binary right it can only have one fluid at a particular point it can't have a mixture I guess that's true for this at a single infinitesimally small point it's a single fluid only and as you move slightly within the pore you'd go into a second fluid but you could average these behaviors within a REV as we called it. And we might like to be able to translate the behavior that we're talking about in capillaries to be able to represent this behavior. So that's what we'll talk about today. And that is that going back to this, then our idea is that we could take um, porous medium. Wish I'd get rid of that thing on the top, but I can't. It'll be gone next time when I get a chance to think about what the hell it is. And we could, if you take a, a porous medium and you imagine centrifuging it so that you end up with all the volume of the solid, the volume of the voids present here. So this is the, the quartz, if you're able to centrifuge it. Then what we could do with this is we can take the void volume And I guess you've certainly seen in your past um, the porosity is equal to the volume of voids divided by the, the volume of voids plus the volume of solid, by definition. Or I guess you could call the, the denominator the total volume of the system. Then this would represent the volume of the uh, non-wetting fluid and the volume of the wetting fluid. So two different fluids. I guess I could give two different colors. Green for this, red for this. And so that's our way of, of separating it. And the reason for wanting perhaps to do that 
is that potentially we could calculate how much fluid of these different kinds was in this system if we were able to just use this definition that we had of saturation. So the, I guess, uh, doesn't want to work. No. Usually it has these smart buttons and it activates these things. So the mass of the non-wetting fluid is equal to the total volume times the porosity. So this is the volume of the voids, not underneath, not divided through. This is the volume of the voids. If we multiply by the saturation of the non-wetting fluid, and we multiply by the density of the non-wetting fluid, then that's the mass that's present. Conversely, the mass of the wetting fluid would be just equal to the same porosity, saturation of the wetting fluid, times the density of the wetting fluid. So that's our reason for wanting to be able to do that. So for now, if we wanted to, and we knew what the saturations of these fluids within this plume, just as in the case that we can define here, we immediately calculate the amount of fluid that was in there, and we could calculate how much we'd want to move or expect to be able to recover if we were able to pluck it out of the system. And so what we'd like to do is instead of looking at the system where we have individual capillaries like this, we'd like to treat it as a continuum. And what we will do today is we'd make this final step here. And that is we'd like to be able to come up with a, a diagram that looks like this, that allows us to link together the saturation of water within the system, which varies between zero and one. And if, you, if it's two phases, if it's not filled with water, it needs to be filled with the non-wetting fluid. So we could also write the saturation of the non-wetting fluid, which would go from one to zero, and link it with the capillary pressure. So what we can do is we could come up with some kind of relationship which would link these. And that relationship will be a curve, which we'll talk about now which would look a bit like, if I can, can draw this, looks like this. And this. We'll deal with it in a lot of detail. A capillary pressure, capillary pressure versus saturation curve. So that's our task for today. I'm trying to think what... Um, I guess, <laughs> doesn't matter, I can just underline it, it'll draw a straight line. So that's our task today. And that's kind of the topic, I guess, of your second assignment, which is, I know the first one is only alive now, but uh, that's what we'll deal with following. All right? So that's our task today. So the first thing that we'll do is um, we'll perhaps talk about um, how we get this parameter or this graph straight away. And it's actually not in the notes for today, it's on the notes after this, so let's just zoom a little bit further ahead. And zoom straight to an apparatus. Just want one figure to, to use. Not a very pretty diagram, but it, it'll make the, the case of exactly what we want to, to do. <coughs> and that is, if you imagine uh, taking uh, in the lab a beaker, uh, and this beaker has in it a, a tube out of the base. It has a frit along the, the base, which is a, a filter. And you could place within this beaker a core, you know, something the size of your fist. This filter and frit allow only water to go through it, not the non-wetting fluid. And you start off with this core being filled with water, brine. It's uh, out of Bear's book, and so it's for an oil reservoir, and so it's defined as brine. It could be water, just regular water. And this is simply connected to define the uh, pressure. It has a seal in here to stop the water evaporating, uh, and this defines the amount of pressure that's present within the system. So now, this whole core is surrounded by a napple. So I guess we'll label it as such. I write that, how big it was. Yeah, perfectly big to see. 
And so what you could do is you could change the pressure. It would really be a capillary pressure. So by defining capillary pressure, we called it the pressure between the non-wetting fluid minus the pressure in the water. So if this was unpressurized, this would be flat. The pressure of the water would be equal to the pressure here, and there'd be no capillary pressure in this. If we increase the pressure coming into this stopper, then it increases the pressure of the oil that's around here. Let's think of this as being this red napple. And if we drew this figure, I guess I'm not sure if I actually have to hold it down to get this. So I'm going to do a replicate of that figure we draw before. Saturation of water starts off at 0 to 1. So this is 100% water saturated. So what's going to happen then as we increase this pressure? Well, this vertical ordinate is the pressure as it's changing. And I suppose what you'd expect is that you could increase the pressure to some amount and nothing would happen. It may be that the pores are too small for anything to go into it whatsoever. So you increase it a bit more. Still nothing happens because the, the, the biggest of the pores is still too small under this particular pressure to be able to squeeze in a little lens of the, the red fluid. And then you take it up to the next point and all of a sudden you find out that that's enough for it to invade. So you get some stuff going in. You can't see the stuff going in because the core isn't transparent, but what you can see is that if um, the red fluid is going in, the amount of water that's in there has to be displaced. The only place it can be displaced is by pushing it out into the tube. If it pushes into the tube, you can measure its volume change by looking at the change in volume in this. So this delta V that you measure here directly changes the amount of volume that's in the thing. And so this, I presume, you could measure what the saturation changes because we know that um, the volume of the wetting fluid, this is annoying, is equal to the volume total times porosity times the saturation of the water, right? This has to be the case. If you know the volume of the pore volume and the volume of the sample, if you know the porosity of the sample, and if you know the change in the volume of the water, then you could measure the change in the saturation. <coughs> That's all. And so you can measure the change in saturation, and that would give you a point, which would be this point here. Right? You've raised up the pressure incrementally. Nothing happens. Nothing happens. You raise it up to here. It displaces the fluid. Happens over a few minutes. You wait for it to reach equilibrium, and you get to this point here. You go in again. You jack up the fluid pressure. at this. Uh, again, you start invading the next pores. I guess it would look like this. You get some more ganglions going in. I guess it should be red, not blue that I'm drawing. And slowly you start saturating this more. And the bottom line is that this, you slowly mount up by doing this. Multiple steps of delta P. And so the only point of all these that we're interested in are the ones that I'm highlighting. And so if we wanted to redraw the curve that I kind of drew as a sketch before and draw up all these points, it would look like this. So this lo locus, if you like, of all these points would be the change in saturation of the system as a function of changing fluid pressure. And then, so we'd have, we'd have got this, and we got this. <coughs> So now what happens? No time in here. So the, the, the time will only be here oh, okay. in that this will be at time zero as you change okay. the pressure. And this would be time infinity, right, for each step. Okay. 
it's not a very good infinity. So, so it's all steady state. And so when we come back down, perhaps the curves would look like this. I'm messing up my colors too much, but you get the idea. I don't want to. Do it. I'm going to do it in red. So come down here. See, the, and the only points you care about now, again, are these individual points here. And I'm probably not going to draw a very good line between them. I'm not sure that is. Your device battery is low. We'll make it. And so this will come down like this. And I made a point. It's a horrible figure, but you get the idea. Is It's hysteretic. It's got hysteresis in it. So we have a couple of important locations. This one, I think, I can't remember if last time we called it, PC0. This pressure is if you had um, two grains and you had a bubble of napple, this would be the pressure that you'd have to apply to push it between this gap. It's the same as H sub C. So I guess PC0 is about H sub C times the unit weight of the fluid the height of rise within the capillary. That's what we can think of. So you've get, got to get over this pressure rise, this activation pressure, before you'll move the pressure in the, the, the capillary. Once you've invaded the smallest capillary, the biggest capillary in the system, then you'll start invading progressively um, smaller and smaller ones because you'll have a larger pressure that can push into them. And you'll move up here. And once you keep on <coughs> going, you'll reach some kind of asymptote. And that asymptote will be a green line that looks like this. It'll go up vertically. Then when you reduce the pressures, you'll come back this curve. And so perhaps it's worthwhile drawing on here two curves. This is what we'll call SW0. And this one is SNW0. So this is the, uh, again, I'm hating this. Uh, I'm not adapting very well. If I write it out, it, this is the irreducible. Saturation of the non-wetting fluid. So in other words, uh, we can't get beyond this point. Uh, once you've started off with 100% water, we've gone up, we've pushed a, the non-aqueous phase liquid in it, we've done something, we've come back down here. That means that we have this amount of water in the system. This is the saturation of water. And this is the saturation of the non-wetting fluid. And so we're left with some residual in there which we can't get out. And we're not going to get it out very easily at all. And so this is just the experiment that we think that we do to do that. It's quite straightforward. All you're doing is displacing progressively the water out of the sample by invading it with another fluid, a second fluid. The second fluid goes in on the tortuous flow paths, which are the most open capillary diameters. Uh, and slowly, as you increase the pressure of the fluid around it, you get more and more of the sample receives the red fluid, and progressively it has to squeeze out the water, and so you advance up this curve here. If you then reduce the pressure in here, the reverse happens, um, and you get um, imbibition, imbibition of the water. You reduce the pressure here. There's a back pressure because of the height of water <coughs> in the tube, 
and the water gets sucked back in from here into the sample at the expense of the red fluid which goes out. And so the utility of this is that we have an expression, yeah? Um, it's just about the, uh, the equation pressure, the capillary pressure initial is approximately uh, capillary height. It's the one in red right underneath the irreducible saturation of non wetting fluid in red. Yes, this one. Yes. Uh, could you just explain that last part? This, th these two? Uh, I understand capillary height, but the last one. Oh, this, th what the term is? Yes. Unit weight of the fluid. Unit weight of the fluid is uh, gamma, which is density of the fluid multiplied by gravity. So, Thank you. Yeah, okay. No problem. Yeah, sure. And so this is the, these are the curves that we'll try and uh, work with, which allow us to be able to say, for instance, if we go back to what we said before, if we look at this, I guess if we look at this figure, these allow us to say something. If we knew what the saturations were here, we should be able to say something about the capillary pressures. And if we know how that we want to invade it, then we know that the pressure that's acting in this has to be supplied by the column of fluid above it. And so if we know what the geometry of this is with the height of the fluid above it, we could perhaps calculate whether we could saturate this at a particular saturation because we could measure this height, we know the unit weight of the fluid, and we could calculate what the equilibrium saturation would be of this. So that's our goal in, in doing this. So that's the, the measurement that we'd make to, to do that. And so let's assume then that we accept that's the case. Um, so the curves that we get, this is a, perhaps a bit nicer looking curve. Let's perhaps try and explain what those individual components are. It shows the same things as before. It's laid out, I think, uh, identifying exactly the same properties as before. So we define an irreducible saturation of the non-wetting fluid. An irreducible saturation of the wetting fluid. These, uh, the non-wetting fluid goes from 0% to 100% or 1 uh, if it's just a fraction. The wetting fluid goes the opposite direction because one has to be replaced with the other one. Right? As you increase the, the pressure in the chamber, it squirts out the bottom. So there's a, a zero-sum game, I guess. Um, there's referred to as a drainage curve. So drainage curve means it's draining water out of the system because the amount, the saturation of water is draining as you increase the, f the pressure. So as you increase the pressure up here, you have to, first of all, nothing happens, and then you march your way along this curve here up to whatever pressure you find yourself at, which is this. And then if you stop here, the hysteresis means that you don't necessarily backtrack down the same curve. It means you cross it somehow. And these, uh, this imbibition curve means that now that you've squeezed some of the water out of it, or forced the water out of it, as soon as you drop the pressure, you imbibe the water back into the system. It gets sucked back in by uh, capillary pressure get, uh, by, because it loves the quartz. The water loves the quartz because it's high, hydrophilic, uh, not phobic. Okay. And uh, we're set along this, this boundary here. And so these boundaries say how much of the napple will be left. So the irreducible amount will be just the mass would be this mass, which is equal the volume of your aquifer times its porosity times the non-wetting saturation. And the amount of water at this thing that would be left would be, again, the volume of your aquifer multiplied by porosity times the saturation of the wetting fluid, I guess, multiplied by the density. And so the reason for this is largely the fact, the hysteresis anyway, uh, we used the analog before about talking about water on a, a windshield. If the windshield 
is in contact with a non-wetting fluid, air, nitrogen, I guess, in large, then there's a different contact angle that it sees compared to the part of the windshield which has been pre-wetted by the bead of water already traveling across it. And so this contact is different from the one that it's seen before. And so it makes sense that the wetting characteristics at this front is different from the unwetting characteristics as it recedes on the back side of it. And so that's the reason for the fact that it doesn't follow down the same pathway that it went up as it first drains and then it wets. And so we can define the behavior as that. So that's our way of defining that. So that's a, a relatively major step for us. So we'll, we're going to look at the, the form of these relationships a bit further as we go through this. And the form is that we could potentially normalize the behavior somehow. So we think that the behavior is always going to look like this. So it's going to have a, a bubbling pressure, what we've called here as this would be PC would be equal to uh, 0 0.3 times what we'll call um, a Leverett function. This function here is what we'll call, well, it's written down here, so I won't write it out, Leverett function. <coughs> And so the idea here is this. Um, maybe we could normalize this in some way so that we could define exactly what this characteristic behavior would be when we're able to push fluid into the, the largest of the open capillaries that we have in our porous medium. And it should be that we could rationalize that because we know that um, we did this that we define these behaviors. We could define this bubbling pressure, if you like, in terms of the capillary pressure, which is defined by the diameter that we have to um, invade. So if we could figure out what was the largest characteristic pore space within our pore's medium, then maybe we could figure out exactly where the bubbling pressure would be, which would be PC0 when the largest diameter I guess this would be the maximum diameter would occur within our system. And so if we do that, I didn't want to do that, then we could characterize it in terms of this function. And so without deriving it, we don't really need to do that, we can set that the invasion will occur when this magnitude of this function here is greater than 0.3. And the function is just a function of the capillary pressure, the pressure that we're applying between the invading fluid, the non-wetting fluid versus the water within our system, which is the capillary pressure. The interfacial tension between the two fluids, which is just a mere material property, and something which normalizes it. And so the permeability is given by this law of case K. We haven't defined permeability yet or talked about it. And the porosity is this term N. So permeability in units is in terms of meters squared. And so um, if you look at this term here, this is meters squared. Pressure is in Pascals. Newtons per meter squared, and interfacial tension is Newtons per meter. It's Newtons divided around the circumference of the, the capillary. And so it turns out that the dimensions of this have no dimensions, and that it's a function of saturation. And so we could define a set of curves, or a, a set of two curves, which are given by the two ordinates here. One is that we get invasion occurring when the magnitude of this capillary of this J function is larger than 0 0.3, which conforms to this. So for instance, if we would know what the permeability of the aquifer was, and its porosity is, and if we knew what the capillary behaviors of the fluids are, then if this is equal to 0 0.3, immediately we can see what height of 
the NAPL would take before it invades. So that could be a useful parameter for us to define. And also it defines this other ordinate, which is at a, a saturation of almost 0.9, where you get this irreducible saturation. I guess this is what we've called SNW0, approximately equal to 0 0.8987. And so that at least allows us to be able to fabricate these curves which say something about the behavior in our porous medium. Um, it turns out that these curves aren't absolute. Um, you could imagine doing these experiments for a whole bunch of different materials. These happen to be, I guess they're um, from the petroleum literature. So these are uh, reservoir sandstones of different characteristics. And if you look at water saturation versus capillary pressure on the left-hand side, you, these are J functions. This is this J function on the left-hand side. This is the term that we defined before, which was 0 0.3. So they don't all quite conform to that. There's some span of these numbers as you go up here. Uh, but you see, in terms of uh, an order of magnitude calculation, certainly 0.3 is right in the middle of those. And it bears on the same kind of behavior that we saw uh, in that initial uh, response. Likewise, all this gives is the, uh, the drainage behavior. So when the non-wetting fluid is invading it, the non-wetting fluid would be an oil displacing water. It d doesn't give the imbibition behavior as it comes back, so we only have part of the curve here. And I guess this is the, the same curve we just looked at here. This is the Leverett curve, this is 0 0.3, this is the 0 0.87, and it's just the, the actual curve that I wrote out. This J function term is capillary pressure divided by interfacial tension, permeability over porosity to the square root. And so this is a general relationship that we'd want to use to be able to look at the, the wetting of these uh, porous media. So the other thing that we could do is that these curves aren't particularly welcoming for us to be able to manipulate. So if there's some way for us to characterize them in a slightly more straightforward way, then what we could do is we could set them as functions maybe of saturation. So certainly capillary pressure is equal to some function of the saturation either of water or of the non-wetting fluid. These curves are just satisfy this relationship. So what we might do is we could try and replot those data in a slightly different way. And the curve that you see up there does that replotting, but these are the two curves that you'd get. So let's say if you started off with um, a relationship where you took this curve and for curve number two, I guess it is, right, that we're looking at? So this curve here that comes up, asymptotes here, is curve number two. So what we could do is we could, instead of having the saturation go all the way to zero, we could start off with the saturation starting here as zero and going to one at this point here. So in other words, we've, we've ignored the fact that this is kind of dead space. And I guess we can rationalize that because we're saying that if you increase the pressure of um, the napple, slowly you, put out, you push out the water and you push out the water up to this amount here and this amount of water to the left of this, you can't get out of it, get out of the system. So I guess in, this is about 0.1, so about 10% of the water we can't get out. So what we could do is we could define an effective saturation S sub E is equal to effective saturation. And we could just define it as this actual saturation divided by the saturation of 1 minus the effective saturation. 
And so if I go back to here, we can do this. So what we're going to do is we're going to cut it off here. We're going to ignore the fact that we can never get in. This is kind of the forbidden territory on this side of here. This is an effective saturation, and this is effective saturation of zero, and this is an effective saturation of one. So this would be the water saturation that we have. So this would be SW0. <coughs> this would be Sorry, that's not right. This would be SW0. Get your eraser out. This would be SW, right? Wrong one. So this is zero. This is the actual, on this graph, this length here is going to be the saturation of water with this. This is going to be the forbidden zone, the irreducible saturation. So this length minus this length on the numerator is just going to be this blue length here. It's going to be this. And then the length here, which would be 1 minus this term here, is going to be this term on the bottom. One is all the way across here, which is this term here, minus SW0 is this length here, and so it's just defining this length here. So the green part that I've circled down here is this part here. And so all we're doing is we're just ignoring this part off to the left. And the reason for doing that is that if now, if we take the log of the capillary pressure divided by the unit weight of water. So this gamma W is unit weight of water. Density of water times gravity. And this is the capillary pressure that we're applying. And if we take the log of this, then we get this term here. And if we take the log of this effective saturation and plot it as a log scale on the left hand side, then we just replot this figure as this figure on the right, then they're the, exactly the same data, but they just look completely different. And the reason for us to do this is that we take this kind of strange uh, looking curve that has some physical meaning to it. This is where a bubble of the non-wetting fluid breaks into it. This is where it can no longer expel the water out of the system. If we plot it in terms of log space, just plot this, this curve in terms of log log, we end up with this new curve here. And it's useful to plot it that way because now it's rotated through 90 degrees, right? So you, if you take the curve on the, the left-hand side and rotate it through 90 degrees, I guess um, clockwise, right? this direction, then the capillary pressure goes on the bottom, the satur effective saturation goes on the vertical side upwards. Then all of a sudden we end up with two different points. This is the bubbling pressure, I guess. So if I were to, this bubbling pressure goes to here. Those are the same two points. And this um, irreducible saturation, I guess, doesn't have a, a, a a point on this because this asymptotes to kind of infinity, right? This doesn't asymptote to a single value. But what it does have is it has a, a slope to it. And the reason for doing that, I don't really need to do the derivation, is that we can define this behavior, which is that the log of the saturation is equal to minus lambda times the log of the actual capillary pressure within our porous medium divided by the material characteristic of the bubbling pressure. Perhaps that's worth writing next to that figure and then talking about it. So the log 
of the effective saturation is equal to minus lambda, the logarithm of the capillary pressure divided by the bubbling pressure. And if we divide both of them by the unit weight of water, perhaps you'll see exactly where this expression comes from, right? So all we're saying is that if we divide um, the bubbling pressure by unit weight, so that would be this term <coughs> here divided by this term here, then all it is, this is the equation of a straight line. So the log of the effective saturation is, limit, is related to the gradient of this line multiplied by the magnitude of the pressure. And it's just normalized by this initial y equals zero value of the bubbling pressure. This is just the equation of that straight line. And so what's useful is that it normalizes this behavior in terms of a couple of characteristics. One would be this gradient, and the other one would be the bubbling pressure. And so together, those two parameters define exactly the form of this line. And so if we go back down to the printed version of what we had, and try and understand a little bit about what it means for these different um, materials, then we took material number two. And if I look on this figure, this is material number two right here. This one. And so what it has is it has a bubbling pressure. And that bubbling pressure is right here. And once we've done the manipulation, I suppose, it has a gradient, which we said before, is equal to lambda over one log scale. Probably chosen the wrong one, right, to do this. Can't see it. So if you do this over one log cycle. So from this point here, which is some distance away from here, this would be one log cycle. Then however long it takes for us to get up to where this point intersects this line, that would be lambda. And this would be one log cycle by definition of that curve. And so the, the steepness of this curve is controlled by this value of lambda. And the, um, the location of the bubbling pressure defines exactly what kind of pressure you have to overcome to get to this. So if you look at these three curves, what in this kind of space does this say about it? It says, for instance, that curve number two, I guess compared to curve number four, is curve number four uh, got bigger pore space or smaller pore space than curve number two. Smaller? Bigger? Meredith Pepka. My guess would be smaller. Yes, that's right. Didn't want to speak? <laughs> so, so so it's smaller. Um, the other thing is that the gradation on here, so if you have a flat line, so I guess for number one, if you have a flat line here, as soon as you invade it at a given pressure, then you invade the whole system. So you'd expect that all the pores within this are roughly of the same size. And so uh, number one uh, would be yeah, I guess I'm not sure whether this, this is the case. 
Four is much more broadly graded. So the value of lambda would, I guess, be much smaller because of one um, log cycle would give a, a smaller value of lambda than the value for this, which would be much larger. So number two is more broadly graded. So something is said by the magnitude of this value of lambda and the bubbling pressure which it invades. Yeah? Um, would we also be able to determine that the pores are smaller because uh, in our forbidden zone, as we refer to it, the, the, the water that can't get out, there's a bigger space uh, for four. Is that concerning correlation there? So yeah. If we draw a line down where four is, you'll notice yeah. that. Except the only thing is we don't know that it actually would go vertical here versus going, uh, keep it on going. Yeah. So I don't think we, we can tell that, right? Because you don't have a range of pressures to see where it would stop. These almost certainly have asymptote to, to the vertical, right? But we can't say that here. And so the behavior, uh, and this represents the, the area around the grains which would have this monomolecular layer of water and also, I suppose, the grain-grain context. We said last time, this is what we call pendulous saturation around it. And so uh, we haven't gone back there, but perhaps it's useful to, to do that, to look at exactly what these distributions are in terms of what they, they represent in terms of this figure here, different forms of saturation. Yeah. So, we, so if this is a, a water wetting soil, it's the soil on the, um, the left-hand side, so this is what it looks like when the water saturation is about 100%. It's not 100% because we've got some of the napple in here, which is the dark stuff. Um, as we keep on um, introducing more and more of the non-aqueous phase liquid, it fills up the space, but it doesn't fill up the space, which is this ring around the individual grains. It fills up the bulk pore, with this, which is in it. And the stuff that's left, which is water, will be these just um, these uh, pendular rings which go around it, these donuts which go around the grain-to-grain -grain contacts. So it says something about the architecture as well, if you like, of the distribution of the pore fluids within the system. So, so that's useful for us to be able to understand that it, it means something about the, the architecture of this. So it allows us to be able to say something about the, the characteristics of the behavior just by using these curves. The final thing that we might want to think about, uh, which we probably do, do have time just to talk about, and that is what this means um, if we would think about uh, binary systems. And so what we've talked about here is that this porous medium that we're dealing with would be this REV, representative element of volume. So here this is probably 95% napple and 5% water in this. We can only see the napple because the red overpowers what we can see. And within this material, um, it's uniformly distributed. If we come to this portion before it, below it, then what we see is that these large grains are supplanted by these much finer grains. And so we might be interested to know what we have to do to be able to invade this. And of course, what we'd have to do is we'd have to have a supernatant height of this fluid that's large enough so that the pressure down here is larger in the red fluid, is larger than the pressure within the clear fluid, the water, for it to be able to break into it. And so we can think about that in terms of what we now know about in terms of this curve. And so the way to think about it is um, perhaps this is the, the simplest way to look at it. So this is for, the, for a non-wetting fluid invading the other one. So if we draw our non-wetting fluid as this. So we've turned our diagram upside down. This is 0% water and this is 100% water. So initially, if we're below the water table, the water table comes up to this point here. The unit weight of water, if we go down within the fluid, just like dropping in a swimming pool, the pressure that we'd see at any particular point here, depth here, would be this amount here. Right? 
So this would be the pressure of water at this point. It's going to be equal to call it Z, right? Equals Z times the unit weight of water. This is just the swimming pool effect, right, that we see here. And so as we go progressively further down in the water, then we'd find that the pressure just due to hydrostat would increase by some amount, and it would be this amount. If we imagine that we can spill a little lens of this non-aqueous fluid into the system, which was green, but I'm now going to redraft as red. It's our red fluid that we have in the other system. Then the distribution of the pressures within that fluid would be given by this other line. If it's denser than water, then the plot must be above the line. So the pressure in the non-wetting must equal the same height change z times the unit weight of the non-wetting. So they only differ by this term that's out added on it right here. Right? And that would be what this amount would be here. So this would be the pressure in the non-wetting. And so the difference between the two would merely be the difference between these two individual curves. And so the capillary pressure, by definition, is just the difference between the pressure in the water, pressure in the water here, and the pressure in the non-wetting fluid here. PC. And so, in other words, this value is getting a busy slide, but it's just this difference between them. At the water table, if you imagine the water table coming all the way up to the surface, the difference between the two is zero. So this refers to a capillary pressure PC of equal to zero. So PC equals zero here. And PC here is equal to, well, it's this length getting larger and larger as you progressively go down. And so this is basically our capillary pressure versus saturation curve. So if you imagine us overprinting our capillary pressure versus saturation curve that we've just been happily drawing by our green curves before, then if we know that we're at a particular depth on here, we would survive, surmise, if it's scaled properly, that we're this place on the curve. If we're this place on the curve, then this would be equal to the saturation of water. And this would be the saturation of the non-wetting fluid. That they, they completely fill the pore space. Together, they have to add up to 1, or 100%. Uh, initially, you start off with almost no saturation in the pore space, because it's only just about to get in there. Then it breaks in, and progressively, the, the saturation of the napple becomes larger and larger as the pressure increases, as the height of the column increases, and you end up with a progressively larger saturation. And ultimately, you end up with a, a residual saturation as you go down. And I guess this magnitude here would be what we call the re re residual wetting saturation of water. And this would just be the saturation of the non-wetting fluid. Or I guess would also, if you wanted to write it out, this would also be 1 minus SW0 by definition. So the non-wetting saturation is equal to that. And so nothing more involved than being able to do that. So we suggested this behavior we can define. So we can define this curve. It's a physical characteristic of our porous medium and the two fluids which are present in it. So we can always get this curve. We could always figure out, if we wanted to, that this curve is also represented by 0.3j, would be this value here. And we know that 0.3 3 is equal to well, the capillary pressure for bubbling pressure 
divided by the unit weight of the fluid, multiplied by the permeability and porosity, square root. And so, for instance, uh, if we knew what the permeability of our aquifer was and its porosity, and what the, um, sorry, that's not the unit weight, is it? That's the uh, interfacial tension. Wrong one. Interfacial tension of the fluids. Then we could always calculate exactly what this is. And so PC0, I guess, also is equal to what we've called the height of the capillary divided by the unit weight of the fluid. So these, these are all interrelated to us. And so the utility of this is that the permeability is really quite an easy parameter and a universal parameter to know for your aquifer. Porosity is probably quite well constrained. 10%, 0 0.1 to 0 0.3, 10 to 30%. The interfacial tension we can get if we know the fluids. And so if we have this, the only other parameter we don't know would be the, in, the uh, invasion pressure. And we can get this directly from this. The other case is that we've always talked about the behavior in terms of capillary pressure. <coughs> we haven't really talked about the fluids other than the fact that one is a wetting fluid and one is a non-wetting fluid. It happens that uh, in this system, our wetting fluid is water, and our non-wetting fluid is the solvent. And that's fine. We can use that to calculate the behavior. Uh, if we go to a system with different fluids, so the Vado zone has water in it, but it also has air in it instead of the napple. And so we can use exactly the same behavior as we had before, to be able to look at the response that we'd expect to get in this system. If we plot as we did before, I guess I replotted this as red. So the water on the system is given by this curve here. If you extend that above the water table, then it's just a straight line extension that goes up here. If I guess I didn't want to do it in red. This is the water. The non-aqueous fluid is, the, is air. The density of air is relatively negligible. And so the, since both pressures at the water table are equal to zero, the pressure in the air as we go up, it climbs almost nothing because it's a thousand times lighter than the water. And so now the capillary pressure is the difference between these two. P sub C is just the difference between these. Before, there was the difference as you went down. Um, the air pressure is very low. The water pressure is in tension, right? Because it's on the left side of this. This is zero pressure here. And so to the left of this, this is in tension. To the right of this, this is in pressure. You know as you go in the swimming pool, your ears pop as you go down. Nothing really happens. Well, I guess they pop also if you're in an airplane. Um, but slightly different phenomenon, I guess. Um, as you go up above here, you're in tension within the water. So minus a negative pressure here gives you a positive. So this is positive capillary pressure. This was positive capillary pressure going down. And so this is capillary pressure going up. At this point here, the capillary pressure, the difference between them is zero just as it was at this point here. As you go progressively higher up, you go up here, and then you see the same behavior. So what's the, the behavior here? This is the saturation of the non-wetting, which is the saturation of the air. This is the saturation of the wetting, which conveniently is the water. So I won't run it out twice. And as you keep on invading with more and more air, then ultimately you go down to the irreducible, uh, somewhere you go down to the irreducible saturation of water, and it would be here somewhere. So it doesn't really matter to us what the individual fluids are. 
so long as we can classify them as wedding or non-wedding based on their physical characteristics. Wedding means it wants to spread all over the quartz, completely cover it with the mono layer, and will only join in a big volume at the grain-to-grain -grain contacts, with all the space inside that being either air-filled or napple-filled. And as you put more water into the system, you would move down here and progressively put more and more water in the system, squeeze more and more air out of the system, and end up being 100% air-filled. Except from what we know about this, we'd expect that if you did re-wet it by imbibing water, then perhaps the trajectory you'd go on might look a bit more like this, right, from what we know. So that you'd end up with something that was more like SNW0. And so the residual saturation of the wetting fluid, the residual saturation of the non-wetting fluid, all that matters is that we know what the wetting and non-wetting fluids are, and then we can decide what this curve looks like. If we know what this curve looks like, we can find out what these ordinates are, because we said that in terms of the J function, this was equal to 0 0.3, which is equal to J, which is the same as this point here. And we said something about this in an ideal world, that this should be something like 0 0.87 just based on idealized model, models, but good enough for the kinds of calculations that we'll do in this class anyway. So, I didn't think we'd get to that, but apparently we did, so, all right?